Welcome to day 17 of the 2023 advent of code. So we have another grid problem where we have a bunch of numbers in our grid. And so let's begin by getting the input. This time we're going to do it a bit differently. We're going to say for each line in the input, we're going to call int on line.strip. We're not going to split on anything because we want to apply it to each character individually. So if we print the grid, we get a 2D array of numbers. Each city block is marked by the amount of heat loss if the crucible enters that block. So we're carrying a crucible of lava and we want to avoid heat loss. We're starting at the top left city block. And since we start there, we don't incur the block's heat loss unless we return to it after leaving. The top heavy crucible is hard to keep moving in a straight line. So we can only go at most three blocks in a single direction before we have to turn. And the crucible also cannot reverse directions. So we want to get from the top left corner to the bottom right corner. We are allowed to go back up and to the left. Um, we just can't go in the same direction more than three times in a row. And so what is the least heat loss we can incur? So we can't do this via breadth first search because it would end up getting into too many different loops and different states, etc. And so we have to use something known as Dijkstra's algorithm. Basically, it's very similar to breadth first search, but instead of just using a queue, we instead use a priority queue, which is very similar to a queue, but instead of first in first out, each time it pulls out the so-called minimum element, and it's up to us to define how uh, we what minimum means, but in this case, it's going to be minimum heat loss. The advantage to this is that the first time we find the end state, it will have optimal value because we traverse them in order of value. This also means that and he's, we, essentially the issue with doing breath first search is we might end up taking a really long winding path and we might not find the actual optimal path, path quickly because we'll get stuck somewhere with like, with like 500 heat loss, for example. But with Dijkstra's, we go through the cheapest option first and so we'll much more quickly converge on the value. Breath first search is actually an, a, I guess, generalized form of Dijkstra's algorithm where the price is basically just how late it was inserted into the queue. Okay, so to use a priority queue, we're going to import the heap queue module. And we're going to import two things. We're going to import heap push and heap pop. The first one takes an array and inserts an element into it as though it were a heap. Uh, a heap is an implementation of priority queue, it basically keeps the smallest element at the top. And heap pop will just remove the element from the array. The first element in the array is always the smallest, but we need to use heap pop because the rest of the elements in the array need to be moved around in a very specific way. We don't need to construct a heap queue because we only have one starting state. So one important thing to know about Dijkstra's algorithm is unlike with breath first search, you cannot in queue and dequeue the uh, save state, like the scene state in when you're actually looking at the insertion value. And so let me explain what I mean by that. Let's suppose we have um, a graph that looks like this. And let's say that the costs are uh, 1, 10, 2, 4, and 6, like that. If we were to check the scene state when inserting, what we would end up with is we start here and want to end here. This gives us a, uh, this means that we can get here in one step. We can get here in two. And then because this is smaller, we'll look at it first and then we'll see that we can get here in 11. Then since this is smaller, we will look at this. But if we check when inserting, we see that this is already seen. And so we skip it. And so then we end up with a final value of 17, but that's clearly wrong. And so instead, what we need to do is we cannot check each time we insert. So when we see this, we insert it again, but this time under a value of six. And now after we visit it, we add it to the scene state. So that's the important part. So we start with scene being an empty set and we start with our uh, priority queue being just an array containing the first state. So we want to get the minimum value first. So we need the heat loss in the first position. So we'll start with the heat loss of zero. Okay. And now we're going to add the row, column, direction we're currently traveling, 
and the number of steps we've taken in that direction so far. So initially we are at 0, 0, and we are moving nowhere so far, so we'll just give 0, 0, and the number of times we've moved in this direction consecutively is 0. So that's going to be our starting state. While our priority queue is not empty, we're going to grab the first element as heat loss, current row and column position, the direction we're currently traveling, and the number of times we've taken a step in that direction is going to be heap pop of pq. We need to check the scene state here. So if, first of all, if rc, dear, if RC is out of range, then we'll end immediately. So if r is less than zero or greater than or equal to the length of the grid, or c is less than zero or greater than or equal to the length of the, of the width of the grid, then we will continue. So we'll skip this. Also, if R, C, D, R, D, C, N is in scene, we will also continue. The reason we don't include heat loss is because if we were to end up in a loop, then the heat loss would be going up each time. And so if we were to include the heat loss in the scene state, we wouldn't actually prevent this loop. Essentially, we only care about the first time we traverse to this state. Otherwise, we will add it. Okay, so now we have two individual steps to process. So if the number of times we've gone in this direction is less than three, and we're currently not standing still, then we can continue going in the same direction. So the way we'll do this is we'll just heap push PQ, and then we'll insert the state, which will be, so let's first grab the next position. The next position is going to be NR, which is R plus DR and NC, meaning next column, which is C plus DC. If it's in the grid, so if NR is between zero and the length of the grid and C is between, and sorry, NC is between zero and the width of the grid, then we will insert the element. And also we can remove this check here because we're going to check the boundary here. So the heat loss will increase by the heat loss of the element that we just stepped on and then we'll go nr and c, the direction remains the same, and we will increase the number of times we've moved in that direction consecutively by one. Now, regardless of our current state, we can also try turning. In order to do that, we'll check every possible direction. So for n, uh, n, d, r, n, d, c being the next direction in, and then we'll try all of the directions. we have two conditions. So first, NDR and NDC cannot be equal to DRDC. Um, even if we can move straight, we're just checking that here anyway. So if NDR and DC is not equal to our current direction, and it also cannot be the reverse of our current direction. So as long as those two are not the case, then we can basically just attempt this again but we're going to try it with NDR and NDC. And then instead of setting N to N plus one, we're going to set it to one because it's our first time moving in this direction. So our consecutive step count is one. The last step is to add a break condition here. So if we're at our destination, we can just print heat loss and escape. The reason this works is because we can never possibly find an unoptimal value here because we're using a priority queue and therefore we always get smaller values of HL out of the way first. And so the first time we see our end position, we will have minimal HL. And so if we run this, it takes a bit, but we get our answer for part one. Before we move on to part two, I wanted to take a moment to talk about Code Crafters. Code Crafters reached out to me to discuss a collaboration with my channel, and I took a look around and immediately fell in love with their product. Essentially, Codecrafters is a platform for learning advanced programming concepts by working on challenge projects, and as someone who's always been a proponent of learning by doing, I truly believe that this is by far the most effective way to learn how to code. I've been using it to learn Rust, which I've been wanting to do since last year, but I could never find the motivation. However, it's excellent even for languages that you're already proficient with, as there's always more to learn and always more you can do to level up your skills. If you're just getting started with a language, you might also be interested in checking out exorcism.org, which is a 100% free and open source platform for learning programming languages with absolutely no prior coding experience required. The development environment is also extremely nice to use. 
Once you've selected a project you want to work on, all you need to do is pick your language, answer a couple of questions, and then you get a Git repository created for you. And you can just clone it, code with your normal setup, and once you're done each stage, you just push it and code crafters will test your code and give you feedback. If you're stuck, they also have community discussions under the stages and code examples if you're really stuck. There are also many perks you can get with a subscription, such as discounts on things to help you in your career, free trials on software services, and more. If you're interested, check them out using the link in the pinned comment and get a 40% discount on an annual subscription. Most tech companies offer learning and development growth funds and will probably pay for something like Codecrafters. So it's an amazing opportunity to learn something new, improve your mastery, or whatever else. Plus it helps support the channel. Thank you very much, and with that said, let's move on to part two. Now part two is actually a surprisingly simple conversion. We've upgraded our Crucible. It is now a bit hard to turn, so it must travel at least four blocks before it can turn. Okay, that's pretty easy. Um, also, or before it can stop at the end. So that's something important we'll need to keep in mind. So above here, we currently have no condition, but we'll need to check if n is at least four. So if we've moved at least four times in the same direction, or we're currently not moving, because that's what the first state starts at, then we can try turning. The second adjustment is that we can move a maximum of 10 consecutive blocks without turning now. So we upgrade this three to a 10. And finally, we also need to check that we need to move a minimum of four blocks in a direction before we can stop at the end. And so we need to add an extra check here that n is at least four before we stop. And that also takes a bit to run, but that will give us our answer for part two. So yeah, that's all for today's video. Thank you for watching and I hope you enjoyed.